We are up on Battle Hill, which is named for the Battle of Brooklyn, also known as the Battle of Long Island. And so this is August 27th of 1776. The British for months have been gathering the largest expeditionary force in the history of the world. Up until that time, some 500 ships are in the harbor. They have 30,000 men on Staten Island. George Washington is in Manhattan, but he also has forces on Brooklyn because he doesn't know which way the British are going to attack, whether they're going to go up the Hudson, up the East River, or attack through Brooklyn. And in the middle of August of 1776, just weeks after the Declaration of Independence, the British launch their forces by ship over to Gravesend Bay, and then they split their forces. And so General James Grant, who had bragged in Parliament that given 5,000 men he could conquer all of North America, is given 6,000 men and is sent along the Gowanus and along the shore, the western shore of Long Island, and he splits his force to come up towards what is now Greenwood Cemetery. And a Hessian force under General de Heister comes to his right. And then a larger main force of the British under Generals Cornwallis and Clinton and Howe go up to the right through Jamaica Pass. And the idea is that Grant will distract the advance force that has come out of the fortifications that are to the north, Forts Putnam and Green and Cobble Hill. And he will get the advance force under Lord Sterling engaged. The rest of the force will come around behind them. And so the battle begins early in the morning hours of August 27th. Lord Sterling, an American general, comes out with two to 3,000 men. He forms a line, and for the first time, the Americans in the Revolutionary War take on the British toe-to-toe -to -toe in the open field during this battle. And this is also the largest battle of the entire American Revolution in terms of soldiers gathered on or about the field. And so a total of 50,000 men. Uh, Sterling's line, as it's set up, is behind us, and the men out there look to their left and they see a, what they describe as a bald hill, and that is the hill that we are standing on now. So the Americans send 300 men at the double quick coming up to take this hill so that the British cannot establish an artillery position up here. As they approach the hill, they receive a volley and they quickly learn that the British have taken the hill. The Americans, Delaware men and Pennsylvania men and Connecticut men are able to storm the hill and take it. And then they hold this hill against two counter offensives. So they are outnumbered. There are 2,000 British forces up here and about 300 Americans. They run out of ammunition at one point, but they are able to hold the hill the British suffer one-third of their casualties for the entire Battle of Brooklyn, which spans miles on this particular hill. And the forces that are up here suddenly realize that things have gotten very quiet up here. And so they go down to where Lord Sterling's line had been and discovered that Sterling is no longer there, that he had retreated to the north and ultimately to the defense at the Vecht House, now known as the Old Stone House, where the Maryland 400 made their gallant stand in the hopes of allowing the other men who had been out here under Lord Sterling to retreat. The men who were up here, learning that Sterling had retreated, try to make it back up here, and unfortunately they are captured and many of them die on prison ships uh, just off of Brooklyn. These are the times that tried men's souls. Those are the words of Thomas Paine, written on December 23, 1776. A few days later, unbeknownst to Paine, George Washington would embark on what we call today the 10 Crucial Days. In those 10 days, Washington will bring home three victories, one at Trenton, a second at Assunpin Creek, just outside of Trenton, and a third one here at Princeton. The battle at Princeton on January 3rd of 1777 was a culmination of those 10 days. Washington's army, using a flank maneuver during the night, moved to Princeton, New Jersey, around the backside of Lord Charles Cornwallis's army. And here he hoped to destroy or capture 1,200 British officers and men who were part of Lieutenant Colonel Charles Mahood's brigade manning the defenses back here at Princeton. Mahood is gonna be surprised to find the entire colonial army showing up towards his rear. 
as he marched towards the front, Mahood turned around and started taking up a defensive position along William Clark's farm and inside of his orchard. As he deploys his men, colonials decide to come out and attack Mahood. This race for the high ground around Princeton will turn into a pitch battle that the colonials will get the better of. As one of Washington's favorite generals, Hugh Mercer, starts to come onto the battlefield, he spies the British forces. As he spies them, he puts his men into a battle line, and 350 colonials start to advance. They halt about 40 yards away from the British, and they start to exchange fire. The colonial line starts to waver, and the British lead a counterattack using bayonets. And in that bayonet charge, Hugh Mercer will be wounded, bayoneted seven times by British officers. His second in command, John Hazlitt, will be shot through the head. Another officer will be bayoneted 13 times. It's a horrific contest. More colonial forces will start to arrive under John Cadwallader. But as Cadwallader arrives with mainly militia forces, his men are deployed on the wrong side of a hill and then caught up in the flight of Mercer's men as they're being driven back by a portion of the British Army. But onto the field to right the situation comes George Washington himself. On a white charger, he comes to the front, starts to rally both Cadwallader and Mercer's men. He brings up reinforcements, puts together a cohesive battle line, and as he does so, George Washington will march his men to within 30 yards of the British guns, halt them, and open fire. One of his staff officers looks out in front and sees Washington still on his charger, almost at the front of this attack, and he hides his eyes. He thinks that Washington will be shot and killed, and he can't bear to witness that. A few moments later, the white smoke rises off the battlefield, and there is Washington atop his charger. And he rallies his men and starts to say that this is going to be a fox chase and chases the British off of the battlefield. More forces will move up into Princeton itself, led by one of Washington's favorite generals, Arthur St. Clair. They're going to corner a portion of Mahood's men in Nassau Hall, which is on the Princeton University campus today. About 200 British men go inside of Nassau Hall. As they do so, they break out the windows and try to make a great fortification out of what is the largest building in the colonies. Four artillery pieces are driven up by the Patriots, and they start bombarding Nassau Hall. As they do so, an artillery shell allegedly decapitates a portrait of King George II, which hung inside of the building. A few moments later, some Patriots charge forward and try to break down the door of Nassau Hall, but British men wave a white flag out the window, and 194 of them surrender, thus ending the Battle of Princeton, and thus ending those 10 crucial days in which Washington won three great victories. He gave new life to the American Revolution and with the blood of the Patriots here in New Jersey, helped to reinforce what was signed on July 4th of 1776. And that was our Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence, a seminal document not only in American history but in world history, was signed in the building behind me. In 1776, that building was known as the Pennsylvania State House. Now we know it as Independence Hall. The Declaration of Independence is shrouded in myth. Most Americans conceive the Declaration of Independence from a painting that hangs in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda by John Trumbull showing all the signers of the Declaration of Independence assembled for one grand signing event. But there was nothing further from the truth. That painting actually reflects June 28, 1776, when the Committee of Five that drafted the document presented the document to the President of the Continental Congress, John Hancock. The story of the Declaration of Independence really begins in Boston in December 1773 with the Boston Tea Party. After the Boston Tea Party, Parliament, with the King's consent, closed the Port of Boston and disbanded the Massachusetts Colonial Assembly. Colonists up and down the Atlantic seaboard were outraged, fearing what happened to Boston could happen to them. And so, in 1775, the Second Continental Congress gathered here in Philadelphia initially to redress the grievances they had with Great Britain and to resolve the problems that had evolved between Great Britain and the colonies. But in April 1775, hostilities broke out at Lexington and Concord. And by the time we get to summer of 1776, a full-blown war is raging between England and her colonies. In June 1776, Delegate from Virginia, Richard Henry Lee, arrives here in Philadelphia 
with a resolution passed by the Virginia House of Burgesses. The resolution, known as the Lee Resolution, declares that these colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent of Great Britain. With the Lee Resolution in hand, Congress appoints a committee of five to draft the Declaration of Independence. That task falls to Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman, and Robert Livingston. Thomas Jefferson would draft the bulk of the document, basing his philosophy on that of 17th century philosopher John Locke, using the social contract as an argument for breaking away from Great Britain. Once the Committee of Five present the document to John Hancock, it is ready to be signed on June 28, 1776. That's the scene that is in John Trumbull's famous painting. After the Declaration was adopted, it was then sent out to be engraved. The document that Americans see when they visit the National Archives in Washington, D.C., in the rotunda of that building, will find the Declaration of Independence as the centerpiece of the Charters of Freedom. Adjoining it are the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Eighty-seven years after the Declaration of Independence is signed and the United States breaks away from Great Britain, Abraham Lincoln, in his own stirring address at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, will reassert the vow that we are having a new birth of freedom. Lincoln believes wholeheartedly in the Declaration and that everything in America stems from the Declaration. To Lincoln, the Declaration supersedes the Constitution. During American history, various people grab on to Jefferson's stirring words and make it their own. They take his phrase to heart and every movement of social justice in the United States finds itself rooted in a chamber behind me in this building in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. After the Lexington Alarm of April 19, 1775, 20,000 militiamen and Minutemen groups from across all of New England converged on Massachusetts and Boston in particular. They were outraged, they were angry, and they bottled up the British inside the city. By the middle of June, their numbers had swollen to the point that General Thomas Gage was concerned about their presence outside of the city. They were led by General Artemis Ward, who is head of the Massachusetts Committee of Safety, who on the night of June 15th and 16th ordered his forces forward to this position on Breed's Hill, which we erroneously call Bunker's Hill. His men erected a fortification on this hill that in the morning when the British woke up, looked out, were stunned, and knew something had to be done. After a council of war with his subordinates, William Howe, Henry Clinton, and John Burgoyne, General Thomas Gage made a decision. He was going to attack the American position located on Breed's Hill. And on the afternoon of June 17, 1775, which was an incredibly hot and humid day, thousands of British grenadiers and regulars embarked across Boston Harbor, disembarked on the shores of Charlestown, and began to assault the American positions here at Bunker Hill. Led by the courageous General William Howe, the British marched off in cadence to drumbeats and assaulted the American position. Thousands of British grenadiers and regulars massed in formation at the bottom of this hill. Inside the American fort, American militiamen trained their eyes and they knew the big fight was coming. They could see the green, gleaming bayonets, they could see the red coats. Allegedly, Colonel William Prescott, one of the defenders inside the fort, ordered his men to not fire until they saw the whites of their eyes. The British marched up in cadence, step by step, inch by inch, they got closer and closer and closer, and when they got within musket range, the Americans issued a withering volley that dropped the British in their ranks in their place, and they retreated back to where they started. Once more, the British marched up the hill. Again, this time, stepping over dead and wounded comrades, they made their assault on the American position. And once again, the Americans fired a withering volley into their ranks. The British once more retreated to their original lines. Finally, on a third assault, again marching over their dead and dying comrades, the British were able to penetrate the American forces, and a severe and fierce firefight broke out inside the fortification. Inside the fortification were several African Americans, including Peter Salem, who saw an officer. He drew a bead on the officer, fired his gun, and took down Major John Pitcairn, who had gained infamy during the battles of Lexington and Concord. 
The Americans broke and ran, but not because they were afraid, but because they had run out of powder and shot. The British won the field, but as Henry Clinton had said, it was a dear-bought victory. After the Battle of Bunker Hill, reconciliation between the American colonies and Great Britain was no longer possible. Benjamin Franklin wrote a friend in England, we were once friends, we are now enemies. The war had taken a fateful turn. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flags to April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmer stood and fired the shot heard round the world. Those words by the American poet and Concord native, Ralph Waldo Emerson, get to the crux of what took place here on Wednesday morning, April 19, 1775, when Patriot and militia units returned fire into the British across the bridge that's behind me, triggering the eight-year odyssey that would become the American War of Independence, also known as the American Revolution. Issues like taxation, representation, respect were at the core of the struggle, and nowhere more was that felt than here in Massachusetts. In early April 1775, Governor General Thomas Gage, commander and military governor of Massachusetts, decided he needed to take action to defuse the hostile relations between the countryside and the city of Boston. At 10 p.m. on April 18, 1775, Colonel Francis Smith and his adjutant, Major John Pitcairn, lead 800 troops west from Boston, objective conquered. Seize the weapons, seize the munitions, return them to Boston, and put an end to colonial hostility. By five o'clock in the morning, they are on the verge of reaching the town of Lexington. But express riders, including Paul Revere and William Dawes, had gotten out ahead of them to spread what became known as the Lexington Alarm, arousing the countryside, raising shot, having bells rung, so that Patriot and Militia and Minuteman groups could form and could react to the British presence. Seventy Minutemen, under the command of Captain John Parker, gather at Buckman's Tavern in Lexington, adjacent to the Green. At 5.30, they get word that the British are in sight. Parker takes his men out of the tavern, crosses over the green, lines his men up in two rows deep, 70 men total, not blocking the road, merely standing there to show their defiance and their anger and hostility. Parker was not looking for a fight. The fight, rather, came to Parker as the British troops came on, entered the green, and faced off against Parker and his men. Parker recognized that he was outnumbered. But he did tell his men, stand your ground, don't fire unless fire upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. But a shot rings out, and nobody's sure where that shot came from. And the British instinctively fire a volley, 17 fall, either wounded or killed. By the time the British reached Concord at 9 in the morning, Patriot units, militia units, Minutemen units from towns like Acton, Sudbury, Lincoln, Bedford, begin to converge here. They can see the smoke curling from the town of Concord. The British are burning the guns, the carriages that they found. They cut down the Liberty Pole. They're burning that too. But it looks to the, to the Minutemen that the town is being fired. And it is decided to march on the town and either die defending it or die trying to defend it. At the head of the band of Minutemen that is going to march on the bridge, he turns to Isaac Davis, the 30-year-old popular captain of the Acton Minutemen, and asks Davis if his men are ready to take the lead. Davis says, I have a man that's afraid to go. The British initially hold a ridge across the river on the western bank, but as soon as they see the numbers, they know they're outnumbered, and they pull back across the bridge, tearing up planks as they retreat. As the Patriot units near the bridge, a volley breaks out, and Davis and several of his men are hit and fall. Davis, mortally wounded, shortly thereafter dies. From the back of the line runs Major John Buttrick of Concord saying, for God's sakes, men, fire. For God's sakes, fellow soldiers, fire. And the Americans unleash a volley into the British. That's the shot heard around the world. British troops fall, and the British flee the bridge in panic, heading back to Concord. But it is going to be one hell of a return march. For the Minutemen who know the area have now raced to outflank the British and to meet them along a road that will take them back to Boston. The British are stunned. They're now being fired on by thousands of Minutemen who have converged from 27 towns. And for the next six hours, it is a running gunfight between the British and militia and Minuteman units. And nothing has been the same on this planet since. 
and so began the arduous eight-year journey of the American Revolution and War for Independence. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers this famous day and year. Paul Revere was a Boston silversmith. He was, he was kind of very involved with the Sons of Liberty pretty early on. Um, this growing movement, this patriot movement, started in the early 1760s. Uh, it started with a man named Samuel Adams, who was a troublemaker and a very, very uh, strong believer in this idea, this crazy idea, that one day all the colonies should be independent and self-governing. General Gage was attempting to disarm the Sons of Liberty. There are a number of powder houses in towns, outlying towns of Boston. General Gage wanted to seize the munitions and he heard that there was an enormous supply of munitions in Concord, and that is the case. Uh, so basically the uh, surprise attack was meant to disarm the Sons of Liberty so that they would not be able to defend themselves in the event of any kind of combat. So the Redcoats are marching on foot and their, their purpose is to seize the munitions. When Revere heard that the Redcoats were moving on that night, he asked Robert Newman to hang these two lanterns as a signal to a group of backup militia in Charlestown who had been waiting and watching with a spyglass every night for about the last week or so. When they finally saw the two lanterns, they knew it was time to ride and they headed up north and spread the alarm all the way up to New Hampshire. There were two men who left Boston that night. William Dawes was the name of the other fellow. Uh, there were also several militiamen alerted in towns as these riders made their way to Lexington and those towns alerted for towns further out so it was a town-to-town -town relay alarm system set in motion by these two men. Each one of those riders was risking arrest and hanging for doing what they did. Now this signal had everything to do with timing. The Redcoats were planning a surprise attack. The Lexington alarm ride spoiled that surprise attack by having our riders get out there first and alert all the towns. So instead of walking into a sleeping village, the Redcoats actually were walking into villages with Minutemen armed and ready to do battle. This was the case on Lexington Green and the case uh, when they reached Concord. Now, this is two lanterns, meaning the Redcoats were traveling, as it says in the poem, by sea. But it's not actually the sea. They're actually crossing the Charles River on boats to Lexington. If they were going by land, they would have to leave Boston Peninsula by heading all the way south through what's called Boston Neck and swinging around west and heading up north to Lexington. That march would have taken about three hours longer. So this is the whole point of that lantern signal and why Longfellow used it in his poem, one if by land, two if by sea. Paul Revere was not, not anywhere near as famous in his own time as he is now today, because every classroom uh, knows the name Paul Revere, and some of them don't know the name William Dawes. Had Longfellow written, listen my children and take a pause to hear the story of William Dawes, then perhaps we'd be talking about a different personality. Unable to destroy General George Washington's Continental Army in their early stages of the American Revolution, the British High Command decided to shift its strategy and focus on the southern colonies late in 1779. The Crown forces enjoyed initial success with twin victories at Charleston and Camden. But in the fall, the tide began to turn with a Patriot victory at the Battle of Kings Mountain in October and again in January 1781 at the Battle of Cowpens. In December 1780, 
Brigadier General Daniel Morgan was appointed to command a flying army which consisted of state troops, Continental regulars, and dragoons. His mission was to move into the back country of South Carolina and harass the British outpost. Determined to defeat Morgan, the British commander, Lord Charles Cornwallis, chose one of his top subordinates for the task, Lieutenant Colonel Bannistray Tarleton. Tarleton had established a fearsome reputation for his aggressive tactics on the battlefield. Tarleton caught up with Morgan below the Broad River in South Carolina on the morning of January 17, 1781. This open rolling meadow was used by locals to herd their cattle before driving them to market and was known as the cow pens. The terrain was perfectly suited to Morgan's battle plan. He decided to form his men into three lines. The first consisted of riflemen from Georgia and South Carolina. Behind that, he formed his militia. The idea, later known as the defense in depth, was to exhaust the British advance and inflict as many casualties as possible before the British reached the third and final line consisting of Continental regulars. There, Morgan hoped to deal a decisive blow to Tarleton. The fighting began before first light on January 17, 1781, when Morgan's riflemen encountered the British vanguard. Tarleton quickly shook out a battle line with his infantry in the center and his cavalry guarding each flank. The riflemen slowed Tarleton's advance before withdrawing back to the militia line. There, the militia fired two volleys and then withdrew to Morgan's third line. Tarleton was advancing into Morgan's trap. When Tarleton's advance reached the third line, it was quickly brought to a halt by the Continental regulars. Tarleton decided to bring up his reserves in an attempt to flank the American position. To meet this maneuver, the Continentals faced about and withdrew calmly as if they were on the parade ground. Morgan, watching from the rear in horror, thought that his line had broken and rode up and down the line, exhorting his men to face about, boys, give them one good volley, and the victory is ours. The Continentals wheeled about and delivered a withering volley into the British ranks. Morgan ordered a bayonet charge, with his infantry bearing down on Tarleton's front and the militia and cavalry swinging around on the flanks. Known as a double envelopment, Morgan's counterattack swallowed up Tarleton's force, and the British retreated in a rout from the field. I gave him a devil of a whipping, Morgan wrote several days later. Indeed, Morgan's victory helped boost American morale, inflicted casualties that Cornwallis could not replace, and set off a string of events that would end nine months later with the British surrender at Yorktown. Washington's sword would have been wielded in vain had it not been for the words of Tom Paine. Thomas Paine was born in England and was raised in England in the years prior to the American Revolution. He was born and raised in poverty. His father was a staymaker who worked in the British shipping industry working with ropes. Paine harbored a deep and abiding anger and rage against the British crown and aristocracy. In fact, he thought that King George III was the devil incarnate, calling him the savage scepter of the continent. In 1774, Paine encountered to meet Benjamin Franklin. That relationship led to Paine coming to the United Colonies and in 1774 intermingling with those who would lead the revolution. Now while Paine was not a soldier per se, he was a genius with the pen. And in early 1776, he wrote a seminal American document, Common Sense. And in Common Sense, Paine argued not only for American independence, but also argued that a new form of government could be created out of the United States. A new form of government in which the people would be at the center of every bit of politics. It was Common Sense that was a national bestseller that was read in churches and taverns and in meeting houses up and down the eastern seaboard of what became the United States. Paine's words gave people, common people, an understanding of what was at stake. And while Jefferson put the philosophy of separation in words in the Declaration of Independence, we cannot get American independence without the words and work of Thomas Paine. Paine eventually hooked up with Washington's army. 
Washington's army was being depleted by men whose enlistments had run up or who were either deserting because of the deplorable conditions. And yet Payne managed to write out a document that hearkened to the spirit of the American Revolution, saying, these are the times that try men's souls. Myth would have us believe that Payne would write his American crisis on the top of a drum. But the truth of the matter is, is that Payne was probably writing some of his many editorials that went in various colonial newspapers at the time. This image of Payne writing the crisis on the drumhead is wonderful literary and artistic illusion. It's patently false. We've often forgotten Thomas Paine, who's been overshadowed by other luminaries like Washington, Adams, and Franklin. Yet Paine's singular contribution to the American Revolution and the cause for independence cannot be underestimated. He is crucial in understanding how the ideas of the American Revolution could be translated so that the average American, both men and women, could understand what was at stake with the American Revolution. After the war, Paine returned to Europe, where he continued his rabble-rousing, eventually ending up in jail during the French Revolution. He returned to the United States after he was released from prison from France and died in obscurity in New York City in 1809, but not before John Adams said in 1805, I know not whether any man in the world has had more influence on its inhabitants or affairs for the last 30 years than Tom Paine. The American Revolution was an international event of global implications. Many Europeans who had found themselves attracted to the ideas of John Locke and other Enlightenment thinkers were swept up in the fervor of liberty and equality as espoused in the Declaration of Independence. Behind me stands a statue to General Rochambeau, the French foreign officer who was most responsible for helping George Washington bring an end to the American Revolution at the Siege of Yorktown in 1781. Rochambeau was not like other foreign fighters who came here willingly and voluntarily on their own. He was sent by the French king to lead the French forces that served under the command of George Washington. This does not dismiss the role that he played because he played a huge role in bringing about the end of the British Empire in North America. The most adored and beloved foreign fighter to serve the American cause was the 19-year-old Marquis de Lafayette. Lafayette was the ultimate lover of liberty, and at the age of 19, he financed his own voyage to cross the Atlantic and come and serve George Washington. So touched was Washington by this gesture that Washington immediately made the young Lafayette into his immediate circle of military family. In fact, in many ways, Lafayette became one of the sons that Washington adopted by default since he had no children of his own. Additionally, other Europeans influenced by the Enlightenment included Friedrich von Steuben, a captain in the Prussian army, one of the German states, would come to the United States at the behest of Benjamin Franklin, who is courting von Steuben in Paris, and guarantees von Steuben a commission as a general in the new Continental Army. Most of America's military successes after the encampment of Valley Forge are directly attributed to the training that Friedrich von Steuben put under the American army. Others included Kasimir Pulaski from Poland, who came and helped put together the American cavalry forces. Some of the Europeans that served to fight in the American cause paid the ultimate price, such as Johann de Kalb, who was bayoneted to death in a futile counterattack at the Battle of Camden, South Carolina. He is one of two generals of foreign extraction to be bayoneted to death during the American Revolution. The other, Hugh Mercer of Scotland, who served in Washington's army, is bayoneted at the Battle of Princeton in 1777. Another officer who found fame in the American Revolution was Tadeusz Kuzuszku, a Polish engineer who came to the United States, helped create the fortifications at West Point. In homage to these individuals, as the new United States spread, many towns and cities were named after these individuals, like Pulaski County, Virginia, Lafayette, Louisiana, DeKalb, New York. It should be noted that European soldiers 
did not just fight in the cause of American independence. The British hired German mercenaries from several of the German principalities to come here and serve alongside the British as mercenary troops. What's ironic is that these Germans, many of them at the end of the war, decided America was a great place to settle, and many of them settled in the United States, making a new home here in the irony of ironies. We owe our independence not only to Americans like George Washington, Nathaniel Green, and others, but we also owe it to the men who took the charge, raised their own money, and came at their own expense to serve in a cause that changed the shape of global politics forever.